Hey, rock stars, Hypervac is back and it's upping the cleaning and restoration game once again. Originating in the 1980s as a humble family run air duct cleaning service in southern Alberta, Canada, Hypervac Technologies has evolved into a global powerhouse in duct cleaning equipment. Their product lineup boasts powerhouse solutions such as the Revolution 360 vacuum and groundbreaking tools such as the Cobra View camera system, all designed to enhance your efficiency. But here's the kicker. Hypervac Technologies dominates the competition with their top-selling non-PTO air duct truck in North America. Hypervac is now back with a bold new claim. Hypervac Technologies now keeps stock on all major products for immediate worldwide shipping, offering overnight freight to the USA and Canada, plus everything they offer is proudly built in North America. And it's not just about cleaning ducts. It's about elevating indoor air quality because after all, your ducts are your lungs. Their expertise extends far beyond North America with worldwide shipping available. With over four decades of industry excellence, Hypervac Technologies is your ultimate partner for reaching new heights in the cleaning and restoration business. So what are you waiting for? Visit their website at www.hypervac.com. Thanks for listening to a word from our sponsor. Let's get back to the show. Welcome to episode 158 of the Business Development Podcast. And today we're chatting mission, vision, and values with someone who was built to lead Jory Evans, stick with us. You are not going to want to miss this episode. The great Mark Cuban once said, business happens over years and years. Value is measured in the total upside of a business relationship, not by how much you squeezed out in any one deal. And we couldn't agree more. This is is the the Business Business Development Development Podcast, Podcast. based in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, and broadcasting to the world. You'll get expert business development advice, tips and experiences, and you'll hear interviews with business owners, CEOs, and business development reps. You'll get actionable advice on how to grow business. Brought to you by Capital Business Development, capitalbd.ca. Let's do it. Welcome Welcome to the the Business Business Development Development Podcast. Podcast. And And now your your expert expert host, host, Kelly Kelly Kennedy. Hello, welcome to episode 158 of the Business Development Podcast. And my gosh, do we have a rock star for you today. Today, I want to introduce to you Jory Evans, a devoted husband, father of three, and a true entrepreneurial force. Jory's journey began at the young age of 16 when he left school to join forces with his father in building Evans Trucking. What started out with just one truck has since blossomed into a thriving enterprise, boasting over 100 trucks alongside several other successful ventures, including a heavy-duty mechanic shop and a commercial construction company. Central to Jory's approach to business is a steadfast belief in the power of company mission, core values, and of course, strong leadership. These principles have been the bedrock of Evans Trucking's remarkable growth and success over the years. Now, Jory is on a mission to share his wealth of experience and insights with the next generation of entrepreneurs through his Built to Lead podcast. With each episode, he imparts valuable lessons on leadership and business acumen, empowering aspiring leaders to chart their own paths to success. Jory Evans is not just building businesses. He's building a legacy of leadership and resilience. Through his podcast and his own remarkable journey, he inspires others to embrace potential, harness the power of core values, and lead with purpose. Jory, it's an honor to have you on today. Oh, and an honor to be on, Kelly. And it sure sounds pretty fancy when you say it all that way, you know, very polished <laughs> and expert. It sounds you know. like you might know what you're doing. Yeah, <laughs> like you can convince someone that I have a clue when you read it out like that, right? It's <laughs> great. Oh, man. I, you know what? I'm never not impressed with the quality of guests we got on this show, you being obviously no exception to that. You know, what you've been able to do throughout your lifetime, and you're not that old, has been incredibly impressive what you know you and your family have built is incredibly impressive and you know your points on leadership is kind of the main reason that I wanted to spend some some big time with you today was just to really get to the bottom of what is critical in leadership how can we lead 
successful ventures? How can we get better at being leaders ourselves, which is a place that you've really decided to focus some time into, and we appreciate that. But before we get into that today, Jory, I really want to get into your journey. You know, who is Jory Evans? How did you end up on this path? Yeah, who is Jory Evans? Sometimes I got to look in the mirror and ask myself that question. <laughs> but yeah, Kelly, it's it's funny because again, I don't feel that young, but I, a lot of people look at me and go, "Man, you're sure young and for what you're doing." And I, I'm 34, turning for 35 this year. You know, I'm young enough to say I'm 34 and three quarters or whatever. <laughs> but the you know, having started so young, it it just it happened so fast to say that I almost have 20 years experience is a crazy thing to feel like I can say already, but I do. Right. And that, that helps. Like, I think starting young is such a benefit and, and a lot of people don't, you know, don't have that leadership and maturity and whether it be mentoring or parenting or whatever to get into it at that age, they're not really sure what they want to do when they're younger. And, you know, it can be challenging and, and everyone's journey is different. So I, I don't see that that needs to be a benefit or a negative, but I really do feel like having started so young that it, it got me a really far ahead in the beginning. So my dad, when I was younger, he drove truck. Like he, he actually was a serial entrepreneur as well. He had his own body shop for a couple of years and he ended up getting, actually getting very ill and sick from painting and being involved with chemicals industrial back then that stuff that they used then was pretty harsh. And some, some people just couldn't handle it. And he just happened to be one of those people. So he ended up uh, losing that business, fought hard to avoid bankruptcy and paying out all his bills, but had to start fresh from nothing again, you know, after building up a business. And so he, he is a story of resilience and, and someone who, who operated with integrity and, and growing up under watching him build businesses and, and work on himself is what inspired me to do the same. So when I was, you know, 14, 15, 16, and even younger, he, he bought a truck and he had his own truck and his, his dad and his brother were both truck drivers. And, and funny enough, when he was younger, he swore that he would never be involved in the trucking industry because he just didn't think that he cared for it, liked it, wanted it. But, you know, lo and behold, you, you fall back on what you know. Right. So, um, yeah. But he's a guy that strives for excellence. And so he he fine tunes everything he does down to the just the fine. He he finds every little aspect and he tunes it and tunes it and tunes it. And I watched him do that from a young age with one truck. Right. And then when when I was around that 15, 16 year old, my uncle decided that he was going to sell out his company. And so my dad ended up buying out his part. And that's kind of when I enter the picture. So he I think my uncle had five trucks, my dad had two trucks at that time. And so there was about seven trucks rolling and uh, enter scene. I'm 16. I'm kind of sick and tired of school. They wouldn't pay me to stay. I kind of wanted to get after it and, and get going. And I kind of always expected and knew that I wanted to work with my dad and in the business and, and grow it. And so, and so that's where we started. Right. And it, it, you know, everyone called me crazy and, and uh, you know, if you don't finish school, you're going to be a ditch digger and all that kind of stuff. But what I think what I'd like to touch on there is that, you know, 16 is a young age. It's, it's too young really to be making decisions that are going to affect you for the rest of your life. But at the same time, totally. you, you, feel, you have this gut feeling and you kind of know who you are and in the direction you want to go. And education, as key as it is in society, I think that we also need to know that education is a matter of personal choice. And you can educate yourself through traditional education, post-secondary, all these other things. Or there's so much free education that exists in the world right now with podcasts, books, YouTube videos, online courses. It's just, there's endless amount of stuff out there that you can get access to. And, and that's how I chose to go about it is I educated myself through, through different means of education. I've read more books than most any person that I know, whether they went to university or not. I've listened to more hours of podcasts and, and every various kind of information I've taken online courses, I've done all these things to give and give myself a degree in business and in leadership by my own doing. And I did it for free along the way. Right. So I think that's an important key is, is that I didn't just jump out of school because, you know, I, I was too dumb or I wasn't capable. I just chose a different path of being educated and it got me started early, which led me down a, a path that, that moved me to where I am today already. So one could argue that had you not done that, you might not be as successful as you are. Today. Oh, and I would argue it. And it's, you know, different times, different places and different things for different people. But I, I don't regret 
that path at all. And I do think it led me down the right path because it get, let me learn as I was ready and as I was hungry for it and passionate about it. A lot of people get yeah. into this education system and, and they don't know what they want to do and they're not passionate about it. And so they don't really utilize that time and that information to the level and quality that I think they, they could if they'd if they were doing it in their right time and with the passion behind it, right? Is when, when you care about something really deeply, you're a lot more motivated and excited to learn about it. Totally, totally. And so much of like business is just about d- being able to deliver value, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure that just because you don't have your algebra that you're not that you're not delivering immense value. <laughs> yeah, ultimately. Yeah. And it's just like, why would you why do you want to learn about, you know, art studies or this and that and again i don't don't want to disparage that path at all but it's just if that's not what you want to do and it's not what you're going to use then you can waste a lot of time going down these these roads and tributaries of areas that aren't going to serve you ultimately right so that that little offshoot there on education but i think it's if you get started early and you and you're aggressive and passionate about something and you choose to educate yourself on it you can go very far with that and and that i don't think people should be discouraged to take that route i think it's a great route to go so yeah, anyway, 16. I'm wet behind the ears, young punk. We're we're working out of our garage at this time. And my dad, in a sense, gave me a shot. He goes like, you're really young and this is a pretty high responsibility job, but you know, I'll, I'll try you at it. And, you know, I'd had experience in business before that, you know, the typical mowing lawns for your neighbors. I'd been in the polishing business that I kind of, my dad had helped me kind of on the side build. And so I would polish all of the, the guys' big trucks, the aluminum and the tanks and the wheels. And I had my own little bo- business in a box is what I called it. And I had all my tools and I'd show up and I'd polish guys' trucks and I'd build them and I'd, you know, make pretty good money at it. And actually, even when I was in school, I was skipping school a lot to do extra work because it was starting to get rolling and busy. And I'm like, it's spring, it's summer. These guys want their trucks done. I'm not going to miss out on these opportunities. And so I had that drive from a very young age. And my dad nurtured it in me as well, because he saw that he's an entrepreneur and he sees it and, and he just you know, blew on the flame a little bit, right? So anyways, I, I took that opportunity with my dad, started dispatching trucks at 16. And I'll tell you what, you want to learn how to communicate with people. Try to, as a 16-year-old punk kid, to lead and herd uh, 50 five to six year old truck drivers that have been doing it for 20 and 30 years, right? (laughs) Like you don't know anything at that point in time. And you got to try and convince people to do what you ask them to do. And you need to learn quickly and you need to be humble and you need to get your, you know, eat a lot of crow at that point in time and, and just learn to communicate. There's a, in, in the transportation industry, you've got guys that are halfway across the continent than you dealing with all kinds of weather conditions and challenges. And there's lots of emotional and heated moments that happen. And, and you become, you know, in, in a matter of speaking, a counselor to some of these people. And you, you're the person on the end of the phone that's the support for them. So you get to deal with them in all kinds of, you know, accidents and conflicts and weather problems and load issues. And just, you know, you get exposed to all kinds of different scenarios, right? And so I did. I I had no choice but to learn. And I'll I'll give my dad credit. When I first started, he handed me Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. And he said, Mm -hmm. I'll I'll give you a raise when you read this book and give me uh, a book report on it. Right. At that point, I'd written lots of book reports for school, but it was about stuff that I couldn't give two (laughs) two cents about. Right. But I just ate that book. Like, I loved that book. I'm like, this is so tangible to what I need to know to do to deal with these truck drivers and and customers and all these challenging phone calls and conflicts. It's like, I need to win people over. I'm doing some sales at this point. And I'm, you know, involved in these scenarios. And I don't know how to communicate. Like, I'm just a 16 year old kid. But that book was just like, it fed that need and desire. I know that this information is pure gold to me. Right. And it, yeah. it really yeah. is what sent me down the road of personal growth and development is, is that, man, if I can learn all this from one book, imagine what I can learn from the next book and the next book and the next book and the next book. And so and that's where my education really began on leadership and influence and people skills and business and finance and human resources, all this types of stuff like there's such a good there's a plethora of information out in the world that's all right at your fingertips if you go looking for it, right? 
And so I did that. And so for the next 10 years, frankly, I, I dispatched trucks. I fixed equipment in the evenings. I changed tires. I got my my license. I drove some truck myself. I did, you know, we did the things that we needed to do. And so when I started, my first year was 05. Um, and so 2008 was three years into my my career of building this business with my dad. And, and that was a challenging time in transport, in all business, of course, but in, in we do flatbed. Mm -hmm. So we move commodities like lumber and building materials and equipment and steel and all those types of things. And so 08 was just a disaster from that respect. Fuel prices spiked, costs spiked, rates tr dropped. And so we were in the, honestly, in the fight of our lives. And I'm, you know, at that time, 19 years old, newly married. We had a baby on the way by 2000 and we had a baby in 2010. So like, I'm, I'm in it, right? Like <laughs> as broke as you've yeah. ever been, as inexperienced as you've ever been. And, and we're, we're battling for our businesses at that point. And we had many meetings at that time. Just like, should we keep the doors open here? Like, is this going to keep going? And we wait, like, I literally for days and days, we would be like, if we're going to make payroll this month, this check's got to land in the mail today. Okay. Right. And it did wow. day after day. And we, we learned to trust, you know, as a Christian person, we learned to trust in God to lead and guide us and yeah. provide for us in that time. But we worked, man. Did we ever work and and put in that effort and and we really had to be passionate we had to care and we had to love what we were doing and believe that what we're doing mattered and so get wanting to get to the topics of like mission and core values and things this is i we didn't have these things then we were just in business and new and didn't know what we were doing and just kind of thrashing around and i think for a lot of entrepreneurs who start businesses they're very good at something you said this earlier you know they're exceptional technician at what they're doing and they know how to do what they're doing and their skill set better than most people in their industry. And so they get this drive to strike out on their own or people tell them you should strike out on your own or, you know, you can be your own boss and all this bill of goods that's sold to people, but that's not enough, right? It's like so many entrepreneurs struggle and thrash around and hammer their head against the wall and trip and stumble and fall and fail and get back up and go again and go again. And it's like a 10 year gauntlet it seems like for a mm -hmm. lot of entrepreneurs and business owners in the beginning because they just don't know what they're doing right they don't have the experience they struck right. out on their own they did the thing which is what they need to do right we all have to take that step and get just start right because you're never going to know all the things you need to know you're not going to know them for five or ten years from now but you're going to find out what you don't know real quick and then hopefully you're yeah. smart enough to educate yourself along the way. So, you know, we battled through 08 and things were challenging for, for a lot of years, but we continued to kind of just slowly grow the business. It was 10 trucks and it was 11 trucks and 12 trucks. And then we moved out of the garage downtown and we got a little shop bay and we did some of our own maintenance and, and we grew and grew. And then we, you know, got to 15 trucks and we got a maintenance manager. Then we got a you know, an HR, like her bookkeeper and, and just little by little, we yeah. made progress, but we got to a point, I'm trying to remember what year it would have been. It'd been, you know, kind of between 15 and 18, where we were kind of in that 20 to 25 truck range. You know, we probably got 30, 35 employees. And I just remember being overwhelmed. Like, I just, I can't, I'm trying to be all things to all people. I'm the puppet master. I pull all the strings. I know everything that goes in, everything that goes out. Every phone call comes through me, every breakdown, every management issue, every challenge. It's all going through me. And I just, I couldn't do anymore. And I'm just like, how do these other people do it? Right? Like, how, how do they lead all these people and have everyone leaning on them and, and continue to progress in business? There's just too many challenges, too many stakes, too many issues. I couldn't communicate enough. People are saying, well, you're not being clear. And, and there's all these other challenges. And, and I just didn't know why, you know, why am I trying so hard and busting my butt to do this stuff? And and I can't even remember if I read it or I heard it or what someone pointed me in the direction, but they said, you, you guys, you need a mission. Like you need something more than just, you know, I'm, I'm doing this so I can make enough money to make sure that my family's good. Right. And, and I really, I started to tie into that concept and ask myself those questions and just go, 
like why why are we here doing this it needs to be more you know so i think simon sinek talks about it uh, a lot is your you know your why what's your why what gets you out of bed in the morning? Yeah. What's the purpose behind what you're doing? And it needs to be something more, something altruistic, something infinite that you can actually like continue. That's a big enough vision and a big enough dream that it can it can continue and endure forever. It's bigger than you, right? It's more important than you and more important than a paycheck. And so then when I dug into that, I realized that what I loved about our business most is that we could hire six hire spectacular people and through our growth we we created jobs and that made people successful and and through all the challenges and and scenarios that the people that came and worked for us they ended up being successful their lives improved yeah. their financial situation improved their mental and spiritual health improved they made friends within our organization they became part of a community and that's what i actually loved about our business and business in general is that you could create this community and you could create jobs for people that set them up for success and so, that, and, and so we t- took quite a long time, but we workshopped that into a, our mission statement that our companies have now. And we have an internal facing mission and external mission, but the internal mission was that we wanted to create excellent jobs for awesome people, set them up for success and make them feel like a part of our family. And when, when I finally got that down and separated, I said, okay, this, this is why we're doing this. Right. And and it just, it cleared, you know, the fog in business that you have when there's just too many things going on. It cleared the fog away. And it's just like, okay, it's not actually like, yeah, we want to make some money. Absolutely. We're not here to, to spin our tires forever, but it, that is not the be all and end all. Ultimately, I want to create jobs for people and bring them into organizations, see, see them as succeed and make them part of a community because so many people struggle and don't have that. And I saw people come out of these horrible situations or work for horrible companies or not have a community around them or any support around them. And when they came and worked for us, that got better. Right. And I wanted, I never wanted to lose that in our organization. So to further down that road, okay, so we got a mission statement now and I'm starting to get the hang of it, but I'm going, okay, I'm still overwhelmed. That doesn't, st- that doesn't stop me from being overwhelmed. And well, what is it yeah. that's overwhelming me? And, and this is where I kind of got down a road with core values and it's, I, I did an exercise and I'm, I'm looking at this point for anything to kind of guide me through how do I, what do I need to become to make this better business? What needs to change? How do I need to do something different? And, uh, and it's so funny because these mission statements, these core values, this vision stuff, I found it so fluffy and I got so much kickback from other people in management and our company when we started digging into it, because it's just like, that's not work. That's not, we're talking about trucking, mechanicing and construction. Like these are the most blue collar type people that you're going to run into anywhere and to tell them, okay, well, we're going to sit down and we're going to do a half day exercise to work out what our company core values are. Right. Yeah. No, no one's <laughs> real excited about that. They're just like, okay, whatever, man. Like you've been reading too many books again. And even my dad, you know, who, who has been an entrepreneur for years, is, he was not super sold out on, on what we're doing. He's like, well, we have good values. We're moral. We have integrity. We're good people. Like, is not good enough? And he's like, eh, I don't think it is. And so we took our management people and we sat down and we did, I, we use the EOS system. I really like EOS. I, I point a lot of people in that direction. And actually at that time I read through their books, Traction and Get a Grip. And I super recommend yeah. those, those products for people if, they, if they're in that overwhelmed state and they're not sure how to kind of get past it. And so we did all the exercises that that thing comes through and we, and we got our core values fine-tuned. So we picked out our seven core values. We did the exercises. And then I went through and I rated everyone in our organization. And then there were about three to five people who clearly did not fit inside of Mm. what we wanted. And when we focused in on those people, go, okay, so all of the stressful situations that come up and all of the things that don't go the way you kind of really want them to. And all of the reasons why someone's in your office, cause there's an internal conflict or, you know, the re- when something is not done according to like the, the quality that we want it done or when they're not, it, it pointed like it just pew, nailed it on the head. It's yeah. like, these are the people that are causing problems in your organization. And the fact that you're tolerating this behavior 
and you're not doing anything about it and you don't even have verbiage or an understanding of how to communicate to them why what they're doing is not okay. And multiple of these people were actually like our top earners, top producers in our company. So Mm -hmm. at that time you're just going, well, I'm, what am I supposed to do? He's our best guy. And at the end of the day, we sat each of them down and we said, Hey, these are our, we sat everybody down, but them in particular and said, Hey, these are our core values as a company. This is what we expect out of you and what is required for you to be a part of this organization. And if you don't improve on this, this, and this, if you're not going to strive for excellence, if you're not going to communicate, if you're not going to be helpful, serving and kind, you can't continue to work here. And, 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 you know, and so this is what I expect and this is what's going to need to happen. And, you know, we, we use the three strike system. So we sat them down once second time it's a written and an explanation. And third time, this is it's game over. I'm sorry. And, and when we got rid of those particular people, I couldn't believe because you're scared to death, right? Like these are at the time I'm going, I'm firing my, my literally highest performing best truck driver. I'm out of my mind. Like this is nothing about anything in business that I've ever done or worked in says that this is a good idea. It's like, go find your best guy and tell him to beat it. <laughs> right. Like, <Yeah. laughs> and, and to this day, like I'll prom- I, I've had a conversation a few months ago with a good friend of mine who's got a, a small business, you know, probably five to 10 employee type thing. And he had a guy that worked for him for five, six, seven years. And he was t- talking to me about, his wife's like the the controller bookkeeper, how this guy had just disrespected his wife time and time again and how he was so it upset him, but he cho- like he didn't let the business and personal get co- like confused. And so he's had conversations with the guy and had conversations with the guy and he just doesn't get better, but he doesn't know what to do. He does his job perfectly, but he's just an a, a jerk to everybody all the time, sure. to customers, yeah. right? But, but he's excellent at his job. And I said, you know, man, I got, I'll tell you what, I fired my best guy. And I talked him through why I talked him through setting up core values. And he ended up within the next couple of months after that conversation, letting the guy go. Wow. And I talked to him a couple months after that. And he's like, I can't even believe the difference in this place. I just want to pause you there for a sec, Jory. Just, just because it's so weird, the synchronicity of this conversation, actually. One of our latest shows we just had with Ross Heward at NBC Group, And same thing, like it's the exact same conversation where he was talking about, they went through an exercise, same kind of thing as you, identified some key players, some people who'd been with them, but didn't recognize, you know, how much damage they were actually doing, how much they were actually holding back the progress of, of his company. And like you said, the difference once they were gone, but it was just, it was, it's crazy that these two things are kind of coming up because I, I literally feel like I just heard this exact same thing, but it's, it doesn't, it must be more common than we think. Oh, That's what I'm kind of common. getting from this discussion. Way more common. And, and you know what? All of these entrepreneurs are sitting in the dark at home in the evening going, Oh, and they're dealing with conflict and they're having internal issues and there's drama and there's challenges and they, and they, they just keep hitting the ceiling like bang, bang, bang. And they don't actually know why. Why is this not building momentum? Why can't I go? How are these other people just, they seem to just grow and go and grow and they're skyrocketing to the moon. And honest to goodness, in our business, that was, it was the lid. It, it's what was stopping us. And, and I didn't realize it. I had no clue that that's like the capacity, capacity for us to grow was limited by how much time and energy was being sapped from not just me, but all of our staff by these people that were not on values. It's, it's crazy. Wow. Like it's their, their core values were what was limiting our company's growth. In fact, I say that without any hesitation whatsoever, because after that, you know, we fired two or three people and then a couple of people smartened up and the drama was gone. And now everyone's like happier at work. Everyone's more productive we hired new people and replaced them and they came in and they did very good work and everyone's productivity came up. And, 
And from that time, when we set up that uh, set up US, and we go through values quarterly, and we, we rate people, we hire people, we put it into our hiring processes, we put it into our reprimands, into our conversations, into our rewarding systems, everything comes around core values. Our growth as a company literally skyrocketed. It changed the trajectory of our company completely in that moment. And there were other wow. factors, obviously. You know, we were probably better managers. I, I started really growing in my leadership and my communication ability through that time because I started investing in it. But the biggest change was that the people that we had were the right people, got better, and we attracted more of the right people who then came in and they were drawn to our organization because of our values, which means we get more good people and put them in the right seats. And then they create more growth and then more opportunities come your way because you've got the right people. And these just start rolling. It's that good to great thing. Wow. Wow. I've never heard it put that way. But what you're basically saying is that your entire organization, all the people in it, they meet your core values. And not only do they meet your core values, they're evaluated on your core values. Oh, yeah, regularly. Yeah, it's, it's a key thing. It's, it, it, there is nothing that I hold in higher regard and esteem in our organization than people on values. You have to be on values here or this does not work. And that when I start feeling like, man, I, I don't feel like going to work or I'm stressed or I'm frustrated, I can almost say, okay, there's something going on with the culture and the values of our organization. And from that time, when we set our mission statement and set our values, the culture in our company got distilled and it stopped being diluted and it, it started to grow. Like it's like good fertile soil. Like the people can grow in that environment when people are under stress and they're, and they're be putting, getting put in constant conflict and they've got the cortisols pumping and they're challenging out. They don't operate at their best. Right. And, and so then it just, it's like, I can't even say, I don't even know the right word. It's like magic. You fix that and everything starts growing. It's like putting a greenhouse over your winter <laughs> garden collection, right? Like yeah. everyone just grows better and they progress together wow. and, and things move ahead in that direction. I know we're on this values thing and I want to spend some time here because you're talking to a lot of organizations who likely this is the first time that they're yeah. hearing this. And I know that might be hard for you to believe because I know you kind of you hit this hard, but there's probably there's probably nine organizations who haven't done this for every one that has. Yeah. Right. And it's wild. And they're hearing this right now and they're, they're thinking, you know what, Jory, this sounds awesome. This makes a lot of sense. But how the heck do you even go through that process? How does one establish company values? Yeah. Well, again, I'll, I'll point people to the EOS system. It's actually my accountant pointed me to the book. And I read it and I was just like, lights went on. There's a five books in that particular thing. I read them all in one weekend. I couldn't set them down. Wow. But the, the basic principle, and again, in my podcast, actually not to pump it too much, but I go through mission, vision, and core values. It's the first three podcasts in the series of Built to Lead. In my opinion, the most important thing you can do. And that's why I started with them. It's like mission, vision, core values hit those things first. You shouldn't go anywhere until you have that figured out. Now, most people don't. Obviously, they're going to build a, a business. And when they start getting frustrated, they're going to look for these things. But that would be, if you can start there, you're so many miles ahead, like miles and miles ahead, you're going to you're gonna take off like a rocket. But the basic principle of the exercise is, is that you take and this works better if if you have a, a team of people at that at that time being you know a thirty person organization. I picked out a leadership team, so I wanted a team of people who I felt were my best people, the people I trusted, and that I wanted to set the culture and the tone for the company. And we all sat down and we said, "Okay, who are our favorite people? Who's the best person in this organization? Who does everybody love? What, what is it like?" So take a person, pick one of your favorites, and maybe it's someone in the room, maybe it's not. And then go, okay, what is it about that person that we love? Why are they special? What is it like that just makes us love working with them, makes customers love them, make them good at their job? And then you can do that three, five, as many people as you want. And we just took a whiteboard and we literally wrote everything down that came to mind. It's like, that guy's really trustworthy. He has great work ethic. He's a good communicator. He's always got a positive attitude. He's always trying to be the best that he can. He's always bringing good ideas to the team. He's a good leader. He, and like fill the whiteboard with a hundred things, you know, however many you can come up with. 
And then after doing that, you take that whiteboard and you go, okay, keep, kill, and combine. So keep means this is really important. We don't want to let it go. Combine means, okay, these things mean the same thing in a roundabout way. So we're going to find one word that, that kind of covers multiple things. And then kill is okay. Like we always, it's funny because everyone wants to be trustworthy and honest, but if you're a liar, then you probably just shouldn't work here. So, you know, that's, <laughs> it's a pay to play scenario. It's like, okay, well, if they're a liar, they're out already. So I don't think that needs to be listed sure. in our core values. Some people choose it, but there's certain things I feel that it's just like, okay, well, every, no liars allowed. Honesty is expected, no matter what. We don't need to write yeah. that down. These things need to be somewhat uniquely us. They need to differentiate us from from other business. They need to be more unique to us in that. So then we want to get that list down to that kind of five to ten, seven is where we ended up. And and again, we're really looking for things that are specific to us and not too generic because I get, a lot of people end up on the 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 corporate core value scenario is like oh integrity honesty mm -hmm. hard work blah 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 and it's like yeah okay Th those are all great and altruistic in value but does that speak to who we are and so once we got down to seven we took our leadership team and we said okay we're gonna rate each other on this list you know at that time six or eight people and he said if, if anybody on this leadership team is not 100 percent on point on these values then we're probably missed the mark somewhere because it's like that that needs to be the case and so then we did that and, and we found that it was it was true of our group and so we've used them ever since now we also meet quarterly to go over our there's a, a rhythm for eos where you go over your values you go over your mission statement you go over your one year three year ten year goals and you set rocks for your quarter and there's a whole process but every single quarter we look at those values and go are those still true do they still apply mm -hmm. to us? Do we not like something about this? Is there a scenario that happened in the last three months that points to us not being on values as a group? And we we literally churn through this thing over and over and over and over again. And for the first two and a half years, we actually made adjustments to it at least every quarter, every other quarter and going, hey, I don't really like, I don't think that specific wording is correct. Or I don't like that word. I think we need a better word than that. Or uh, we're actually going to kill. I think we maybe had eight or nine before. We're going to kill these two because I don't think that, you know, they're they're unique enough. Or I, I think it just makes it bigger sure. than it needs to be. And so you just keep kind of beating that thing down until you just, you believe it. You know it. It's just ingrained in you, right? There's a There's a tool called the People Analyzer. The People Analyzer takes your core values and it gives you a rating system, which is plus, plus, minus, and minus. And so plus being most of the time, this is true of me, plus, minus is sometimes yes, sometimes no, minus, not very often. I'm not very often in a, a, have a positive attitude. I tend to be a bit of a negative Nancy, right? But other people are better judges of themselves than you'll ever be able to be of them. And so we use that tool in every single interview that we do. And so we'll, we'll go through the basic typical interview questions. And actually, all of our interview questions are each tied to a core value, whether it be through process or for, for whatever purpose. We always go, okay, this in some way needs to speak to values in their answer. And we need to be able to kind of surmise something um, to do with our core values out of it. But then right at the end of the interview, we have them rate themselves on all of our core values. And then when they're done, we actually talk through each value and what it means for our company with that person and make sure they understand how important our values are to the company and make sure they understand what they mean and why. And then we talk, if they give themselves any plus minuses or minuses, we have them talk to why they feel that maybe they're not on point with that value or why they rated themselves that way. And we've also actually found that when people do plus minus or minus, often they're actually being hard on themselves but they're being honest and they're trying to improve themselves or not think of themselves as above like the perfect person. Right. And so it, it's often a good totally. sign of people are being a little critical of themselves and looking for a place to yeah. improve. But since doing that, we don't, we don't lose people very often for one, like our churn is, is sub zero, especially in management positions and in uh, in-house positions, like with truck drivers, like I believe the industry average in truck drivers is a 90% turnover rate, which is just insane. Wow. I don't know how you build a business, but because we attract the people on the right values and they know it coming in, it scares off the wrong people 
like they'll often like if someone's clearly not right they'll often pull tells hey i just i'm I'm not gonna come or you know i don't think i'm a good fit or whatever and then the people that do come in they know what's expected there's no surprises whatsoever right yeah. and so if in the first three months it's like wow i've we really found that you're not very helpful serving and kind and you have a pretty negative attitude do you understand why that's a problem and how that doesn't fit here right and there's yeah. it's not like well what does that matter it's like okay well the, half the interview is based on this topic so yeah <laughs> kind of you know it. so it's no surprises <laughs> they find their way out a lot faster and they don't stick around and they know what's expected and so it just takes the play out with that and because of that we have such a lower turnover rate that we grow faster like i i've told so yeah. many people if i had to even deal with a 25 or 30 percent turnover rate that's how much we grow every year like we grow 20 to 30 percent to 50 percent to 100 percent some years and I have to hire that many people to fill all those positions. If I had that and a turnover of 20, 30, yeah. 40, 50%, we wouldn't be able to grow. No. Like we would just be maintaining with how many people we're hiring right now. And so it, it that is, I think, a, a key factor to our growth is just that we people understand the core values. And we go, we went through all the work to get it perfectly right. And we stand beside it and and protect it religiously. Yeah. And you've had so much success too, right? Like it, it's not like we're just talking about, you know, one venture. Like at this point, you're doing three. And the one that I find really interested as well is, is Evans Pro Development, your commercial construction company, because that's so different from trucking, right? Yeah, totally. And yet you've taken these principles, copied them over, and have created a very successful commercial construction company. Yeah. And how, how well did it translate? It's good. It's funny starting a cons commercial construction company because for the first few years, we're, we're literally three, four people in this company. So it's kind of almost a hilarious exercise to sit everyone down and talk about core values because you're such a tight team and it seems a little silly, but we still did it because I yeah. so believe in the process. But it, it works like it... it it, when someone's having an off day, it's like, hey, remember the value in this company is that we're having fun, right? So if you're not having fun, we need to make sure that we take a step back. And uh, and because and interestingly enough, all three companies have a completely different set of core values because of the people who lead them and of what is most important in that organization and who's in management there, wow. which I found extreme. Like I didn't expect it actually when we did the exercise. I'm like, no. well, we'll probably end up on the same things. You get to the end, you're like, these are actually completely different and I actually understand why because of the people that I did the exercise with. And I understand what they value, you know, the people who are running the business and they're the leaders within your organization are the ones that have to exemplify these values to the team and have to work with other like-minded and, and values people. Well, then they have to be tuned to the people who are in leadership. Hmm. It's curious. It makes me wonder, do you think that one set of values is more valuable than another? No, I don't think they are. I think that it's, and I've read this a, a dozen different times and places, is that they it's not what your values are. It's that you have the correct values for the team and that they're set in place and that they're utilized properly. If your values are that we are a bunch of grumpy old ogres and everybody is and everyone gets that and gets along with it, then you're probably going to attract <laughs> grumpy old ogres and you're all going to get along and cuss and swear and dust at each other all day. But at least you'll know what to yeah. expect. Right. That's funny. It is funny. It's funny to me, but it it's, I've found it to be true because of the differences in our companies and, and they all, they do have different cultures and personalities, each company. Yeah. Which I like, I like that they're different. I like that they have their own personalities. And I like that when people are a part of that organization, that they fit there and it, they attract those type of people to them. Yeah. It's so funny. It's like I've been doing this show a very long time at this point, And yet this has not once come up. This is my very first conversation with anybody on mission, vision or values, which blows my mind. At this point, we're at 158 episodes, yeah. right? Like, it's pretty wild that it hasn't come up yet. But, you know, when you were talking about the power of values and why it's so critical that people are on board with this, you know what it really got me thinking about? was the power of consistency. And that is what is so critical in business development, right? The difference between a good business development person and a, and a rock star, like the best one you've ever seen, is that they follow a process consistently every time. 
They don't break process. They do the same things when it works, when it doesn't work, because over time, the trend is up. The trend is it works, right? And it's being able to consistently sit down and make all those calls, send all those emails, add the new connections, make the new pitch over and over again, week over week that makes business development people successful. And I think that the value of consistency is one of those things that makes them successful. And so I could see why if you were to hire based on a set of values consistently, especially values that you've recognized are winners in your organization, it is going to make you a lot of money. It's going to allow you to grow. And it's going to allow you to get the right people on your team. And I never thought about it that way before. Yeah, I think reading another book, I'm a big reader, so I like to cite stuff from books I've read. But in e- the book E-Myth Revisited, he talks a lot about the franchise model. And one of the key points he makes is that customers want, customers want to control their experience and they want a consistent experience. So if they go into McDonald's and they, they get a burger and they decide that, you know what, I like quarter pounders. Next time when they, they're craving quarter pounder and they want to order a quarter pounder, they don't want a different experience. They want the thing that they're craving. If you go get your haircut, yeah. you want your haircut exactly the way you want it each time for the most part. And so we don't like surprises when we're, we're buying a product or a service. We want consistency, right? And that's what you're hitting on. But when you're dealing with a company and you go and show up and one day the guy behind the counter, counter is like super positive, bubbly, nice guy, super helpful and kind. And, and he helps you do this thing and you go over there and he, he loads your stuff up and brings it out for you and he gives you a discount. It does all these particular things. You're like, man, that was just such a great experience. And then the next time you go in there and the guy's just a, a grump behind there and he's like, yeah, what do you want? Doesn't want to be there. Well, now you haven't, you're having an inconsistent ex- experience and it makes you not feel really comfortable going in there again because you don't know what you're going to get, right? And so yeah. when you have all these people consistently on values, when someone deals with your company and is provided with a service and then they deal with one guy and they deal with another guy and another guy and another guy and another guy, but they're all positive, they're all helpful, serving and kind, they're all excellent at what they do, they all are good communicators, they all have positive... like then people get used to that and they know what to expect. And so they'll come back and they'll come back and they'll come back and they'll come back. And that's where that consistency really helps you to, to duplicate your, your process over and over and over again. Yeah. And let's, let's spend a minute on process. How important is process? (laughs) I, my last podcast I just did was on systems and processes. I said the sexiest topic we've ever had is on system and processes. It's like not, not a single entrepreneur. Well, that's not true. The organizational geeks of the world do appreciate it, but it is for me being like a visionary person who just love, like I'm a people person. I'm a visionary person. I don't like tedium. It's really tough to do the processes and the systems, but I've come to realize that it's extremely important for your growth. If you don't get your systems and processes correct, it slows you down. And the, the, I think the key point that I found with this is that when you don't have a system or a process, and even to even to values, like even talking about vision and values and mission, if you don't create a system and a process to revisit it, to regularly communicate it, to get it out there consistently, like every month or three months or week, or in each meeting, we come across these things, then they just kind of get lost in the background. And we're required to go back and relearn and reteach these things after it's been long enough that we've forgotten. Yes. Right. And the That's amount right. of energy it yep. takes to train a person on a process or a system or on values or, or how you like something done or a tricky scenario that takes a ton of energy and a ton of time as, as a leader and an entrepreneur for you to one, learn it. And then for you to teach it. And especially with things that like a a core values, you could do your mission statement and your core values exercise, and then you can put it on, on a wall and then never revisit it again. And then it gets lost in, because it doesn't have a process or a system to make sure it's consistently communicated. Right. Yes. And then now that's right. You're down the road a year and you're now reteaching and relearning and re well, what was, why did we pick positive attitude as a main one? What was the purpose behind that? Yeah. And, and you just, you're yeah. wasting your energy. You're wasting yeah. your mental, emotional, physical energy re going over these things, but where we create these processes and rhythms, you get in that, that the habit, scenario it becomes a habit it becomes part of who you are and you're ha- like i think it's james clear said your habits are who you are you are whatever your habits are 
right? And so yeah, systems and processes is creating creating things that you want yourself and your company to be into habits that you just do automatically because over and over and over click where it happens, right? Yeah. And I think that if you're sitting here right now and you're saying, yeah, like we have process, but you can't explain it. You don't have process, no. <laughs> right? You have to be able to explain every step of your process and why you do it. It needs to be ingrained. Otherwise, you need to go back to the drawing board and reevaluate. Yeah. Well, and how much energy does it take to train a person? Like if you want to get into like core processes and like standard operating procedures, which is the super boring stuff, if you can yeah. hire someone put them with another person for a day or a day or two of shadowing and then hand them a core process and they can pretty much do your job. You got it nailed. Right. Yeah. Whereas if you go, totally. okay, well, what do you do? What's your job? And they go, well, I kind of do a little bit of this. There's a little bit of that, a little bit of this. And you're like, okay, so can you train someone to do that? Oh man, that's going to be, you know, that you yeah. don't have a process. Right. And it's slow. It slows totally. you down and people, cause it takes five times the energy to create the process than to just do it yourself. And that's why yeah. so many I'm leaders save, don't do it. Totally. And I'm going to save so many people stupid amounts of money right now by just saying in your next hire, when you're hiring your business development specialist, right? I've heard so many people say, Oh, you know, we hired all these guys and they just never worked out. They didn't do what we hoped. The one thing that I want to ask you to say is the next time that you're in that interview, just say, walk me through your business development process from beginning to end. And if they stumble or struggle to answer that question, don't hire them. The right person will be able to tell you from point go all the way to the close how they're going to do it. If they can do that, they have process, they're going to be successful. Yeah. And yeah, the consistency, it's it, it's a great word. It's a key thing. And I think, you know, hopefully as entrepreneurs mature and grow in their businesses, they come to value consistency. It's the boring things that make us like exceptional, really right? That you do day in and day out over and over and over again. How do you think, Jory, people get to that stage? You know, like, I know I didn't always operate at that stage. I definitely started to operate at that stage at a level when it was my ass on the line, when it was my company, my name, my brand, Kelly Kennedy, where if I didn't deliver and I didn't do what I needed to do, that there were going to be repercussions to me personally that I really stepped up and took consistency as a core value in my life. And it is it has led to immense success, not just, you know, with this show, with my business, with my coaching. I I I have processes and procedures and things that I do and I show up day after day and I put it out. I make sure that my show's released twice a week, bar none, bar bar you know, come hell or high water, that show is coming out, you know? I make sure that my clients are dealt with and I get my client work done consistently and that I'm doing the calls, I'm doing the the connections. But for me, it really did come down to it needed to be my baby. It needed to be my name, my ass on the line, my reputation. How do you think we can motivate people to be more consistent when maybe they don't have as much to lose if they're not? Yeah, that's a man. I don't like I don't like to motivate people because I just motivation isn't always going to be there, right? We're discipline and it's like discipline will always be there. And so people need to be disciplined to do what's right. And they need to have a, a why, like a reason. Right. And and I think that's kind of what it comes down to is if you don't have a good reason to do it. And for you, like you're talking about it, my ass is on the line and my reputation and my integrity is going to fail if I don't figure this out. Well, that was what motivated you to do it or inspired you or whatever. But at the end, you'd had to be disciplined to do it. That's you had right. to do it hell, come hell or high water. That's not like, well, when I felt like it, I got it done. That's like, I, I created a discipline, I systematized how I'm going to do it, and I execute, right? And I think that, I don't know if you can motivate people, like either either you're going to learn or you're going to hit a wall and you're never going to overcome it. And that's actually where, and why I started the podcast that I'm doing with Built to Lead is because I've I met so many entrepreneurs who hit a point in their business and they just never overcame that point or they they don't know what to do, they're just stuck. Right. And I was there at that 25 truck time in my life. Like I was in that spot. I am stuck. I don't know what more I can do. I'm overwhelmed. I'm frustrated. And I'm tired. And and I went searching for answers and I found them and I, and I implemented them. But it, what it came to, I was at a conference with Ed Milet actually once. And I asked him a question. I said, okay, what does it take to go from a $10 million company to a hundred million dollar company? 
and it's not the answer that I expected that he gave, but it was that he said, okay, well, who's the guy that leads a hundred million dollar company and what's the difference between you and him? And what do you have to become in order to be the guy that leads the hundred million dollar company? And this is partly what pushed me towards the leadership thing is, is that in order for me to lead other people, I have to overcome these things myself first. I have to build myself into the person that can overcome these problems, that has the skill sets, who has the discipline and all of the things and knowledge and wisdom and all the things required in order for me to lead other people. So I had, yeah. to, I had to look at myself first and go, okay, well, at a 25 truck company, I'm overwhelmed and I'm, I am the problem. I'm at the top. I'm not doing good enough. I'm not communicating well enough. I'm not organized enough. I don't have enough systems. I don't have enough consistency. I, and I didn't, you know, I wasn't consistent back then. I, I, I yeah. had to change myself. And for me, the thing that changed me the most is I actually did 75 hard, which is like a, it's a mental toughness program where you do 75 days straight of multiple exercise, water, diet, no alcohol, all this, this big long list of things that you got to do every day. And it's without fail, no excuses. And I did that for 75 days straight. And it was an exercise in willpower. Like I have never had to put wow. myself through, but I was, a, I was honestly a changed man after I did that because I realized that I had horrible time management, that execution is a decision and, and that you just have to show up. And if you show up every day, day in, day out for 75 days on all, and you do everything right according to this plan for 75 straight days, you look back two and a half months and you go, oh my word, I cannot believe how much progress I can make in 75 days. It, it's insane. Wow. One of the questions, one of the questions that I have is, you know, listening to your story, it took you guys roughly, roughly 11 years to go from zero trucks to 25 trucks, right? Mm -hmm. But it's only taking you, what, five years to go from 25 to 100. Dude, that's like massive, massive growth. Yeah. What changed? What what happened? And not to mention through COVID, by the yeah. way. Well, yeah, just <laughs> right? like, and that's not, that's just the trucking side. Like we had no mechanic shop. We had no construction company. We had maybe... 30, 35 employees, then we have 150 plus now. Right. And so wow. it, it, it became explosive exponential growth. And it was what changed was we, we started doing that EOS and we got consistent. EOS is a meeting rhythm that made us consistent. We met, we focused on these items. We set our mission, we set our vision, we set our goals, we set our core values and we hit them. One, we have one meeting every week. We have one meeting every quarter. And we have one meeting once a year, right? And and we just hit them over and over and over and over and over again. We communicate consistently. We set our goals and we hit them. We, ha we have everyone's held accountable through the system, right? We check our data. We, we measure things. Like it, there's a whole system behind it. But it, it was life-changing. But at the end of the day, it came down to me deciding to be a better leader. Because if I didn't change at that time, if I didn't decide that I was I was going to be consistent because no one else was going to do those meetings unless I told I led them to those meetings. I had to be a different leader. I had to be better than I was. And I think that this this consistency game, you realize in order to be everything that you can be that you you have to become consistent. You have to systematize yourself. You have to have discipline. You have to be mentally tough. You have to make the right decision over and over and over and over again. That doesn't mean you're not going to fail or have a bad day or anything else, but you have to, to cultivate that discipline and that consistency in yourself as the leader, because you're not going to lead anyone better than you to victory. And so you have to be the best and you have to stay far enough ahead that everyone behind you is chasing you and coming up alongside. And you have to raise the water level so that everyone else comes up with it. Wow. Wow. Jory, that was amazing. Thank you so much for coming on today and, and giving us some lessons in leadership and pointing some people towards values. I think that this is going to inspire a lot of people to sit down and be like, okay, hold on, hold on. There is more to this and we need to figure out what our values are. So I appreciate that immensely. I want to take 
five to 10 minutes here and talk a little bit about your organizations and what they do in case people need them. Can you take us into all of your various organizations on your podcast briefly? Yeah. Yeah. It's constantly changing, but uh, like we just (laughs) acquired another uh, car hauling trucking company. We've been historically a flatbed company. We're a long haul. We do flatbed all over North America, not including Mexico but we haul lumber, steel, equipment, all that kind of stuff. And so this new foray into car hauling has been really interesting and learning a lot about it, but that's cool. Really, a really cool business as well that we're doing. Yeah. And, and I grew up riding in a truck with my dad. I, I really do love trucking. I'm passionate about it. And I love just running a, a high, high quality, efficient, clean company there. And so, yeah, Evans trucking is that business. And uh, if you're looking for hauling, then, you know, give us a shout cars or, uh, or flatbed, or actually we do a lot of oversized equipment now as well. The other business is Evans HD, which is a heavy duty mechanic shop. We do uh, diesel engines, performance uh, and maintenance. That's grown. That's grown exponentially since we started it. It's interesting because I, w- I was the customer from the trucking side and I got so frustrated with how poor quality of maintenance and support that we were getting that it, it just became, I had no other choice. I had to do something. And so we started doing our own maintenance and, and that turned into, well, I want to do a better job and have better people and more access and more tools and more software. And so we, we started doing it for customers as well. And it was interesting being on both sides of the coin in the respect is that I'm the customer. I know that the customer's frustrations and that needs, and now I'm also the service provider. And so I know what the pains and the struggles and the frustrations are on both sides of the coin, which helps us very cohesively put together an amazing product. And I guess we moved into our building now, which was brand new to us four years ago with five technicians. And now we have 15 techs on the floor and we've just finished, we're just finishing our expansion of this building and we'll be operating 50,000 square feet of shop and we'll probably be up to 20 technicians here shortly. So it's, it's grown exponentially. So that's, that's four, five years, basically five. I think we're in our sixth year in business with that one. And that's grown huge, like from zero to you know, we'll be 12 plus million a year now in, in revenues and expanding, looking to hit 20 within the next one to two years. So that's grown really good. And then the construction company is we do commercial general construction, mostly for ourselves. We've done it, but we've done lots of same thing. We do it for customers as well. So we built our own buildings here, a couple and a couple of customers in the area and kind of we're branching out to doing, you know, shops and offices and, and large scale commercial projects. And so that we just had, we started with two people and I think we're six now on that team. And I think we did about 6 million last year in, in revenue. And so that's, it's, yeah, it's been a really fun, interesting business. Construction is a whole nother ball of wax from the other two businesses. So steep learning curve for me, but it's been really fun. And like I said to many people, I, I only really like high risk businesses where you can lose a lot of money if you screw up. And so that's, that's where I kind of like to do business apparently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that it keeps you motivated to succeed for sure. Yeah, don't goof up. It's only a couple million dollar building. Don't goof up. It's only a hundred thousand dollar engine mm-hmm. rebuild, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but take us into built to lead. Because that's that's blowing up. Tell me a bit about your podcast. Yeah, Built to Lead. I said it earlier, but I, I just I found that I was having a lot of conversations with other entrepreneurs just about the challenges that they face in their business, and they would ask me, "Well, how are you doing that?" Like you, like you said, how have you guys exploded and grown and and brought on so many new people and and done so many amazing things in the last few years? And I'm like, well, I have a lot to say on that topic, and I can't possibly have it. 10, 20 hours worth of content and conversation in, in a lunch or a coffee or whatever. And I'm a pretty busy guy. The other part was as our organization grew, I really struggled when we're kind of hitting 100 plus people because I'm used to being very relational with my staff and, and having coffees and having time to spend talking and growing and mentoring people. And it just started to get out of hand. So I just didn't have the time to touch each person, each individual person enough. And so my kind of solution to that was to create the podcast so that when people enter our organization or want to know more about who we are as a business and who I am as a leader, that they have the ability to to listen through these podcasts and I can touch more people and, and get more information out there. So I really have a heart to help other entrepreneurs overcome those kind of glass ceilings that they face. And I feel like through mission, vision, values, and all kinds of other things that 
that I can help people grow into being the best leaders they can and, and to build better organizations. And I feel like our communities and our world is like entrepreneurs has some of the most influence of anybody anywhere in any country or any place in the world. And so people who are building really cool things and creating jobs and have access to finances and, and the ability to be generous and give and change the world are important and, and that they should really try and work and grow. And if I can help them in any way, I'd love to do it. So that, that was kind of the heart behind the podcast. Yeah, I think yeah. we're we're somewhere around 12 or 13 episodes now. So we're not quite at 156 or whatever we're at here today. But <laughs> I'm told that if you get 20 podcasts out, you're in the top 1%. So we're on the way, That's right? There. You're on the way. You're on the way. And honestly, dude, like leadership is so critical. And I would say like just given the level of success that you've been able to achieve, that if you ever wanted to take that step into like leadership coaching or something like that, I think you'd have a lineup a mile long. Yeah, I, I think someday we might get there. I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty tapped to building what we got and build and do you know what it is is I'm building our leaders in our organization and I know that the the cap on our growth is limited by the leadership that we have built in our organization. So I spent a ton of time growing leaders within our organization. But as as I learn to lead as I lead leaders and teach them how to lead leaders, then it 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 helps me grow to a point where I believe that I can add value to other people on that level as well. There's a lot of coaching things out there in the world. And I, I always think that the people that coaching should ha- should go out and prove they can do what they're going to coach for before they go coaching about it. And and that's kind of where I feel like I'm at now is that, yeah, I can, I can share the podcast for free with the world with limited time input, but I want to prove that I can, I can build something amazing and good. And that I have those leadership capabilities to do that before I start telling, telling people too aggressively and charging them for that opinion. (laughs) (laughs) Jory, what is the cumulative value of your companies? Oh, well, that's a bit of a relative term, but you know, we're doing 50 plus million dollars a year in revenues. I'm trying to hit a hundred million in the next few years. So, you know, somewhere in the 30 to $50 million range. You know, I'm using this as a use case as to why you should just do leadership coaching. I think most people would would agree that you've made it. Yeah. <laughs> I think all good entrepreneurs feel like they've never made it. They're pretty critical. It's like, oh, I'm just getting started. Come on, Kelly. <laughs> oh, dude, I really love this. Thank you so much for coming on. I appreciated this conversation. Yes, and thanks for having me, Kelly. I really appreciate the invite. And I really appreciate the business development podcast. I think you're doing an amazing thing here that, that a lot of entrepreneurs can can use and lead and help grow from it too. So I think your heart's the same as mine in trying to grow this community and, and help business owners succeed. Totally, totally. And like you said, you know, like I speak to what I know. I don't get into leadership. I don't get into, you know, hardcore business running. That's not my world, but I'll teach you all about business development. Yeah. You do it well. <laughs> Amazing. This has been episode 158 of the Business Development Podcast. We have been graced by the CEO of Evans Trucking, Evans Pro Developments, and H or Evans HD, Jory Evans. It was an honor, Jory. Until next time, this has been the Business Development Podcast, and we will catch you on the flip side. This has been the Business Development Podcast with Kelly Kennedy. Kelly has 15 years in sales and business development experience within the Alberta oil and gas industry and founded his own business development firm in 2020. His passion and his specialization is in customer relationship generation and business development. The show is brought to you by Capital Business Development, your business development specialists. For more, we invite you to the website at www.capitalbd.ca. See you next time on the Business Development Podcast. Hey, rock stars, Kelly here. And today I want to chat about one of our amazing sponsors, At Work Office Furniture. If you're an entrepreneur looking to upgrade your workspace, At Work Office Furniture is your go to partner. For over 40 years, they've been providing premium, affordable office furniture and top-notch design services. Whether you need a single desk or a complete office overhaul, At Work has you covered. Their team of experts help you plan your space to maximize both comfort and efficiency. They're at the forefront of modern office trends, including those super cool office pods that give you an instant quiet booth enclosure right in your open space and movement-based setups to keep your team healthy and active. Here's the best part. 
Atwork delivers and professionally installs across North America. No matter where you are, they'll make sure that your new office furniture arrives quickly and safely. I personally use an office chair and adjustable desk from Atwork on a daily basis for my work and absolutely love them. Support the business that supports entrepreneurs like you. Check out www.atwork.ca to see their amazing range of products and services. Transform your workspace with At Work Office Furniture because great business starts with a great office. Thank you, At Work, for your support of the Business Development Podcast. 